Um, welcome to the 16 o'clock session of uh, uh, the first floor here at PyCon Day, day 2. Um, today we have a, a very nice talk by uh, Patrick Schemitz. It's called From Java to Python, Migrating Search Functionality at Billiga Day. That'll be 25 minutes and then five minutes afterwards for Q&A. Enjoy. Well, thanks for attending. Um, now that we all had a coffee break and we're all fully awake and alert, um, we can forego the coffee cup and switch over to Python. Um, first, so I work at this, work at this company. Uh, we're like 300 employees, mostly here in Karlsruhe, including almost all the tech stuff. That's why you see so many people with these t-shirts running around. Um, we also have offices in, in Leipzig and Dresden, and um, quite a few people in, in Plovdiv in Bulgaria. Um, as you can see from these uh, logos here, we have quite a few brands, but the core of the company, the core business is price comparison. That is what we do in so many words and logos. And for this talk, I'm going to focus on, on the German aspect of the market, which is um, currently by far the largest. Um, in Germany, our main venture is the website Billiger.de, price comparison site. And there's also a syndication partner API, which basically provides the same functionality as the website, um, <clears throat> including all the, the offers and, and the search functionality. Um, the data set I'm talking about here is um, the German data set that is uh, 2,500 data feeds from like 50,000 uh, shops, online shops, delivering 65 million offers. And these offers change quite often, quite drastically, like 10% um, of these offers will change every day. There will be new offers, old offers will be deleted, there will be price updates, there will be updates to the description, updates to the availability, items might go out of stock. So um, there's at least 6 million changes a day. The main website, Billiger.de, is visited by like 200,000 people every day, typically, and the main website and the syndication API combined account for 17 million search requests on a typical day. So this is the website. Um, on the website, you can search for stuff like, like these winter tires by, by the Goodyear make, and um, you will be then presented with a choice of offers for, for this, uh, hopefully, for this, um, for this tires. And you have the, um, the ability to, to further drill down the result, to restrict the results, to, to filter it. And um, as I said, 17 million requests on the 65 million um, offers data set. How do we serve these requests? Uh, back in the olden days, that is until February this year, it's not, not so olden days, the architecture looked like this. This green box would be one server, typically a dual 6-core or dual 8-core, 128 gigabytes of RAM, terabyte SSD, pretty decent hardware. And on this machine, there would be one Apache Solar instance with one huge index. That index would contain all 65 million documents. Um, we fortified Solar with a few custom components, and I'm going to talk about these in depth. Um, but first of all, the clients, that is um, the Billiger.de website and the syndication API, the partner API, they don't directly access Solar. They have to go through a JSON RPC service, the search service, which encapsulates the actual search. This is a um, remote procedure call. Python um, makes this look really nice. This looks like a, a normal local procedure call. In fact, it's, it's RPC, JSON RPC. And the search service runs our standard company uh, tech stack that is, um, it's, it's written in Python, the web application, and using the Pyramid framework in an Apache and ModWhiskey setup. That's, that's pretty standard in, in the company. Now, 
also on the server is this updater. The updater feeds the six million updates per day into the solar index. Typically, this is done every 10 minutes or so. There's a batch of updates. Um, at night, fewer updates. During day hours, lots of updates. Yeah. Um, so how does this architecture scale? When it comes to number of requests, it scales really nicely. We have 20 of these boxes for the 17 million requests. Should the need ever arise, like 30 million requests or so per day, we would just add another 10 or so machines and handle that. That's, that's really nice. What is not so nice, however, is how the thing scales when it comes to index size. The 64 million documents, when I build a new index on the machine, the index will be 50 gig in size. And that is manageable, barely. However, due to the way um, Lucene, which is at the core of Solar and also Elasticsearch, handles, handles updates to documents, that is, um, it deletes and reinserts them, um, this index will blow up pretty quickly. It will blow up to like, and, I've seen 180 gigabytes, I've seen 200 gigabytes after three or four weeks of operations. Um, and this really drags down search times. This is not viable. We have, to, we have to switch architecture. So what we did is we did what everybody does these days. We went cluster. And going cluster, quite frankly, sucks. The big one. Because going cluster makes everything much more complicated as you can easily see from this new, the target architecture. Uh, now, we still, have, we still have the search service on the green boxes on the servers, but now there's two servers forming one cluster, and on each of the servers, there are now three Apache Solar Cloud instances. So, for a total of six instances, um, each of these instances will hold one-sixth of the index. And to make this work, um, we have this guy. This is Apache Zookeeper. Now, you were all reading the solar reference guide in the bath last night, so you probably all know that Apache Zookeeper is a distributed configuration management tool, um, originally from the Hadoop ecosystem. And um, it's also capable of providing distributed transactions over these nodes. So not only does it do um, configuration distribution, but also um, coordinates the updates. Because as you see, there's only one updater. This machine has no updater. Doesn't need one because all the updates are fed here into the cloud. And then um, Solar Cloud, in conjunction with the Zookeeper, will make sure that, um, that all documents end up in the right shard. Shard is the solar term for, uh, for the sixth of an index. So. I'm going to dwell a bit about the components later on, and um, just to give you a bit of orientation, when I, when I show you Java code, it is from here, from the custom components, and when I show you Python code, it's from up here. This is where um, the migration takes part. But um, before we go into the, um, into the um, components itself, um, let me give you a brief introduction to the solar uh, component interface. And that is how you write solar components in non-cluster mode, that is. In non-cluster mode, you have this interface, the search component, and um, when you inherit from this interface, you've got to implement these two methods, prepare and process. Now, the prepare stage is invoked after the query is initially parsed, Query to Solar is an HTTP request, and um, Solar will then um, process the query itself and, and make some kind of Lucene slash Solar object from it. And after that is done, for all the components we have configured, the prepare method is invoked. Then, after all the prepare methods are in, um, have been run, the search is performed, the actual search, and finally, after the search, all of the components process methods are executed. And um, now there's one more thing I want to talk about, and that is the response builder object. Response builder is, is a bit of a misnomer, really, because while it, while it does build the response, 
but it does much more. It also contains the initial request, and it will also collect any results. So the first component I want to show you is this one, the QLTB, a bit of a cryptic acronym, which means Query Local Term Boost, that is, term boosts that are local to a specific query. What we do is um, we boost successful terms, terms being a search engine t um, expression, um, in this case boiling down to, to filters or, or offers, specific offers, for, t for queries we already know. The data looks like that. Here we have a query with the text Xperia X. So somebody is searching for an Xperia X, for Xperia X would get the following effect. Um, all the offers that have in their brands field the value of 12316, which happens to be the brand ID, our brand ID of, Solar, uh, of Sony, will get a boost. We'll get a boost, that is, means the score will be increased and the documents, the offers, will drift towards the top of the search result list. The same goes for categories. Now, um, offers with a category ID of uh, 4373, meaning cell phones, happen to be the, the cell phone category in our category tree, um, we get a tremendous boost. Uh, and it gets even more fine-grained. We can boost individual, um, individual offers, like this uh, particular model, the Xperia X 32 gigabyte in the color of black, meaning that our users do have good taste. Um, <laughs> And this one will get a tremendous boost. This will probably be the top product. Now, where do we get this data from? We harvest it from the click logs. Um, we register the interactions of the user with the search result page. We check where they click. They click on particular documents. They click on, um, on filters on the left side. And we register this in the logs. And we digest the logs. And we generate a huge XML file. And the updater, you remember the, the, in, the, in the bottom of the green box, the updater will then place this into the solar config directory. Um, by the way, the component is, uh, is open source software. Um, you can find it on the company GitHub. And um, now I'm going to show you the, the Java code. Maybe I should mention this as a trigger warning if somebody has post Java stress disorder or something. Um, but it's not that bad. Well, for this component, anyway. So um, we have the QLTB component, which uh, inherits from the search component and um, overrides the prepare method. And in the prepare method, first thing we do is we get the original request. That is, we get the original query string, what the user entered, and the original query object, what the solar parser made of it, right? And then we got to jump through some Java hoops and finally arrive at the boost map, get boost map. That is basically um, the in-memory representation of this XML file I just, um, I just showed you. And get the appropriate uh, entries, the term boosts, the list of term boosts for the query string. So we end up with a list of term boosts. Now, what do we do with these? We have to build a new query, Boolean query, so we can add multiple clauses, and the first thing we add to the new query is the old query, and the old query must occur. So up until now, we just replicated the original behavior, except with more overhead. What we do now is um, we add the boost terms we got from the QLTB boost map. We add the boost terms, um, we add them to the new query, and they should occur. That means they're optional. If a document doesn't have the boost term, if, if um, an offer is not from the category of a cell phone category, then, well, it will still show up in the results if it matches all the, the words in the query, but it won't get the boost. And finally, we replace in the request, this is the response builder, there we, uh, this weird named um, thing, um, we replace the query with a new query. Now, when later on the query, the search is executed, now this one is executed instead of the original one. And the process method is empty. We don't need one here. Now, this doesn't look too bad, does it? Um, where could possibly strike the cluster trouble? Um, it strikes in the form of the updater. 
um, the updater is no longer present on all the nodes. Remember that the second node, the second server, doesn't have an updater. So how do we get the QLTB XML to the second server, to all the components? Now, you might be thinking, wait a minute, he just told us about Shovel Guy. He with a uniform fetish. Um, that sounded like a job for him. If he could just, just stop shoveling elephant dung for a moment and help us with our XML file, that would be great, wouldn't it? And um, in fact, that's, that's exactly right. But there's a problem. Shovel Guy can only handle files up to one megabyte in size. Yeah, and our XML file is typically five to 10 times that size. So Shovel Guy is out, unfortunately. And instead of recompiling the zookeeper with a, with a changing, patching the hard-coded limit, we took a step back and, um, and thought about it from a wider perspective because, oh, thanks, um, because we already, in the company we already have a standard way of distributing data among nodes, files among nodes, and that is we you, you typically use MojileFS, which is an open source distributed file system, some of you might know, and um, we have pretty decent um, support libraries um, within the company. Support libraries for Python, that is. So what we did is we re rewrote the thing in Python. We moved the functionality to the search service. And the Python code looks, looks really neat. It's quite short and sweet. Um, we still need to get the boosts um, from this QLTB module, which basically reads the XML file. Um, we get the boost terms. For, for the query. That here is the signature of the central JSON RPC function call of the search service. We, um, I conveniently omitted most of the parameters here. Um, is, is Jenny here from the last talk? Because she will probably be upset when it comes to the number of parameters of this function. Um, well, and anyway, if, if we get um, boost terms for this query, we convert them filters to solar, and then we add those boosts to the solar request. BQ is um, the solar parameter for boost query. Now, looks innocent enough, but you might be thinking, wait a minute, he didn't talk about the green function. That's kind of cheating, isn't it? Uh, well, not so fast, because the green function, as it turns out, is already there. This code really integrates, integrates nicely into the existing code base. This is, what, this is a bit more of the same functions, and um, here I show you two more parameters, filters and boosts. So the client of the search service might specify their own filters and their own boosts, like boosting, boosting um, offers that have an image, for instance. And um, to process these, we already have this function. We, use the, we feed the filters, we convert them to solar, we, the user's filters are converted to solar, and then in this loop, add it to the solar request, but this time using an FQ instead of a BQ, FQ meaning filter query, that is, the filters must occur. And same goes for the boosts. We convert the boosts to solar, and then loop over them, add them to the request as BQ. And now you'll notice that this code is virtually identical to that code. The only difference is those boosts come from the user, from the client, that is from the Billiger website or the syndication API, whereas those boosts come from the QLTB data file. So that's a huge simplification. Now, the other component I want to talk about, um, faceting and filter alternatives, needs a bit of a run-up in the form of um, a couple of screenshots. Now, somebody was looking for an Apple iPhone. And that somebody narrowed down the search. I think this is hardly re readable in the back. So this means category cell phones. There's a filter set on categories. Uh, somebody filtered for categories cell phones. And um, um, now there's 199 results left. Notice that here in this category filter, there's also a, another category meaning cell phone cases. And there's a lot of them, 52,000 to be precise. So now if this user would, were to set another filter, a price filter, say, um, several things would happen. Now, this is a price limit of 280 euro minimum. 
and you immediately see that the number of results changes. That's what you expect, right? All the, the uh, less expensive stuff is gone, including the iPhone um, SE, which was the first hit in the previous screen. But more things change, specifically this changes, the category filter box changes. Not only is there now only 166 instead of 199 um, cell phones, but the cell phone cases are gone entirely. And that is because there are no cell phones, uh, cell phone cases which are more expensive than 280 euros, fortunately. So uh, now that, that takes a, a bit of a, a moment to wrap your, your mind around the concept. It's quite intuitive to use, but it's very, very confusing to explain. Um, but it's not as confusing as the Java code. I'm now going to show you the Java code, and the Java code is, in fact, is ugly. In fact, it's it's absolutely barbaric. Um, anyway, let's push Centurion aside and, and see if we can learn something from this atrocity. Um, there's two things, there's a lot of thing, things wrong with this code, but two things in particular. First of all, there's a loop, the blue code is a loop, right? Uh, there's a loop over the, the filters we have set. This is, um, this is uh, the category filter and the price filter we loop over. And within this loop, still in blue, we do a searcher.getDoc set for filter alternatives. The searcher.getDoc set is in fact another name for a search. This executes a search in a loop. This should set off a few alarms for the, um, the ones of you concerned with user experience um, doing these costly operations in a loop. Um, but it gets worse, because the red part is where we get the counts from, the uninverted field index, and then getting the counts and stuff like that. And in this code, we're already up to our elbows in the guts, in the eternals of the solar search engine. This is a private, this is, this is actually un undocumented internal code. And by solar version 6, it is gone. Well, the, the functionality is still there, presumably, somewhere. Maybe, um, but really, why bother? The code is, is so ugly, I really felt the urge to, to print it out and burn it in the company parking lot. Um, and um, and, it's, and it's, it's pretty slow as well, um, because we do this search in a loop. So, um, so what we do is um, we, we move the functionality to the search service. And this solves both problems quite elegantly. I mean, obviously, you can't use solar internals from outside solar. Um, but it also solved the, uh, or much improved the, um, the latency with the, with the several search calls. And that is, um, this is now almost all the parameters. Um, I sincerely hope that, well, um, <laughs> that nobody is, is linting or pep this. this. Um, and what we do now is we, we still have to iterate over all the filters we've set, over the price filter and the, um, the category filter. But this time, we don't execute the search, but we only append it to the list of requests. And, and we re reuse all the parameters from up there. The underlying parameters are the ones that show up just exactly in, in the search method, in the, um, in the interface of the search service. Um, we replace the filters with the partial filters, we can get rid of the boosts, we can get rid of the paging. Um, and then we do something very nice. We, this one, search threaded on, on a pool of workers, um, does exactly the same thing as that, but in parallel, on a pool of workers. So what we do now is um, we, we still have to execute all those requests, but we execute them in parallel and thus hiding it from the users. The user will experience only one of the, the slowest of them, unfortunately. But, um, but we can hide all the other requests. And um, this is much easier done from the outside of the, of the, solar, uh, of, of solar, uh, of the solar component than from the inside. So, we got rid of some really nasty piece of code, and we improved the user experience as well. So that is really nice. And um, that's, that's the components I want to talk about. Um, let's come to the conclusion. That is the very brief version of the uh, conclusion. Uh, more elaborate. Um, first of all, the switch from solar to solar cloud um, 
was really nice. It, it improved user performance drastically. You can see this. This is one from one of our Grafana dashboards. Um, the, the green line with the nasty spikes is from the old um, huge index uh, setup, whereas the yellow line down there, um, that's solar cloud. We could operate this in parallel for a while, and, and this, the difference is really marked. Um, Solar Cloud itself works great. Uh, we've been operating um, lots of instances now for for seven months, and we it's it's really we hadn't had a problem at all. This is really working working great. Um, we moved the functionality in, in total. We moved six components up to to, um, to to the search service, all six components, and um, for that. And that is a really important lesson if you're using anything like Solar, Solar Cloud, Elasticsearch, Postgres with um, complicated stored procedures or non-trivial Postgres setup, anything like that. Um, do yourself a favor and consider encapsulating such a thing in a service layer. Because the service layer, the search service, was having a search service was absolutely crucial for migrating the functionality because now we have somewhere to move the functionality to without changing the clients. And we didn't have to change the clients. We in fact, we, could we, we ran this in parallel for a few days. So this is, this is the most crucial advice I can give you for that. And rewriting the components in, in Python was absolutely fantastic because let's face it and that's because we're here python is just the shit thanks for your attention thank you patrick for that wonderful talk uh does anyone have any questions raise your hand the gentleman up here um, why are you not using the solar faceting functionality for your faceting? We are, in fact, um, with the search service, we, we are we are using the the, um, the faceting results for that. Um, thing is, the faceting, the default faceting, will only return the facets that are available for the result set for the 166 filtered iPhones. But we need more. We need also the facets for the for, for the uh, for the stuff we moved away, uh, that actually you can actually get facets while disabling single filter queries you gave. I'm sorry, I I, I didn't so, hear that. So when you calculate the facet numbers, you can tell tell Solar to do this over more than your result set. You can tell them to to ignore certain filter queries that were part of your original query. Um. Okay. While I can't answer that right now, you, you'd have to, to point me more specifically to what, what you mean. Could you, could, you, could you come by to our booth um, after the talk? That would be great. Thanks. Because I, I can't really answer that right now. No. Does anyone else have, have a question? Hands up. Mm -hmm. uh, when you presented your stack, you showed that you were using Apache. And why don't you use Nginx? Why do you prefer Apache? Um, it's well from my point of view it's uh, I'm, I'm not the, the the infrastructure and platform engineering guy um, from my point of view it's just the company standard maybe could you elaborate on this Roland huh? yeah okay you can uh, uh, yeah okay if you want to know more about it uh, <coughs> check them out later in the booth the Billiger day downstairs uh, I believe we have time for maybe one or two more questions anybody No? Okay. Well, let's uh, give another round of applause to Patrick. Thank you for coming.